our tale takes us to the city in France called Nancy, or Nancy, depending on your pronunciation. So recently there was a round robin tournament held in the city of Nancy, uh, and it was actually the 12th Festival International du Conseil General de Métis et Moselle à Nancy. Ah. So basically it's a big tournament. It was featuring 10 players. There were uh, three grandmasters and six international masters and a fide master. So we had Andre Isitrescu from France, we had Ivan Bukovshin from Russia, and we had Yuri Solonichenko from the Ukraine as the grandmasters. And we had some international masters as well, a few French international masters. Um, and this tournament took place a couple of months ago in, in France, in, in Nancy. So, um, so there was a game in this tournament between Alain Gensling, a, a, an international master from France, born 1989, and Alexander Donchenko, an international master from Germany. So in, in this tournament, uh, Donchenko actually performed reasonably well. He, he finished equal third, five and a half out of nine. And Gensling actually, unfortunately, finished dead last, two out of nine. But we're going to take a look at this game because it featured an important theoretical novelty. And so let's take a look at this game because it was actually very interesting. Okay, so uh, Gensling was white and Donchenko was black. This is from March 8th, 2014, uh, the eighth round of this tournament in Nancy. So it was a Queen's Gambit accepted, d4, d5, c4. Okay, d takes c4, and so white plays the most principled reply, e4. Just immediately challenging, threatening to win this pawn back. So if black's not going to get overrun by white's pieces, he has to do something. And so one of the more common ideas for black is to simply try to hold on to this pawn for dear life. So, so black plays b5, and white has to try to challenge this grip that black has on this pawn. So white plays a4, this is all kind of natural stuff, c6, a takes b5, c takes b5, and now knight c3, uh, developing with tempo. Okay, so all this is, is, has been played before. Um, you know, queen's game accepted isn't super common at higher levels, but um, and even this move e4 is not super common. Usually white prefers to play a move like knight to f3 first, and this move b5 is actually relatively uncommon. Usually white will, or black will immediately play e5. So it's kind of a sideline of the queen's game accepted, but I mean this position has occurred uh, over a hundred times before. Uh, actually uh, Sokolov has played this as black, and um, Pon Mariyev has played this as white, so it, it's not super rare. But this next move that black plays is very rare. So um, white's attacking this pawn. So tell me, guys, what is the most natural way to defend this pawn? What is the most natural way to defend this pawn? because um, white is threatening to take. There's no real trick. So for example, if you play a move like g6 or something, knight takes b5, there's no queen a5 check, obviously, because there's a rook here. So this pawn is, is being threatened. So what's a natural way to defend this pawn? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, so you have to be careful here because um, because this rook on the a-file is very active. So if you play a move like a6, notice that this pawn isn't actually defending this, right? Because after knight takes pawn, this pawn on a6 is pinned due to the rook on, on a1. So a6 looks natural, but you have to actually ask yourself, is it really defending this pawn? 
And, and it turns out that this rook is pinned. So, right, the most natural move would be to play a move like bishop to d7. So the most natural move would be to play bishop to d7. And this is indeed the most common move in this position. And, and white scores fairly well here just because, um, you know, white has this big center and a lead in development. Um, this open a file also helps white, actually. So, so white's down a pawn, but the pawn he's down is this a pawn, and it, it almost helps white in a way that, that he has a missing a pawn because it gives white's pieces more activity. Okay, so bishop d7 is, is what's often played. Okay, but in this game between, again, Alain Gensling as white and Alexander Donchenko as black, Donchenko played the move a6. So I spent five minutes telling you guys why a6 was impossible, and yet black, a, a 2463 international master, played a6. So can someone figure out what the point of this move is? Like, wh wh why, wh why is this move make sense at all? It, or, or does it? I mean, did the international master forget that this pawn was pinned? Or is there some reason he played a6? So can, can anyone figure out why he might have played a6? said it was the best move. I'm not saying it's the best move. I'm just saying that it's apparently a playable move. Apparently a playable move. And again, I'm not saying it's it's next necessarily good, but what what's the point? Like, okay, if white takes, is black intending to take back? And if so, what is his response if I take the rook? So, so you have to ask yourself these questions. And can someone see why? Can someone see why this move makes sense? So yeah, so soldier has the right idea. Soldier and Aku have the right idea. So yeah, basically what, what Black's doing is an, a, a positional exchange sacrifice. A positional exchange sacrifice. Um, I don't know, let, let me offer a word, a word of warning. In, in this position, if you ask a computer what's going on, the computer will say, Knight takes b5, x clam, white wins by force. Well, not by force, but, but a computer will really like white's position. Because, okay, I mean, if you, if you don't take here, this move a6 makes absolutely no sense. It just makes all your pieces worse. Uh, I mean, you know, eventually, like, so say you play like bishop b7 or something here. I mean, this is just terrible, because, okay, I just played knight c3 again, this, this pawn's gonna fall, I have this massive center, and now I'm not even down a pawn. So this is a, a, a gigantic advantage for, for white. So you have to take. You have to take. And so the, the, by taking, we cement this pawn on c4, but also after rook takes a8, we have this opportunity to play bishop to b7 now. And now we're forking this and this. So in, in this game between Gensling and uh, Donchenko, this is exactly what happened. And so uh, rook a1 was played to, to move the rook away. And in this position, black did not immediately capture on e4, but played e6 first. So the point is that if uh, white tries to defend this pawn somehow, he can actually get into some severe trouble. 
Like, if he plays a move like f3, it's actually very hard to develop this knight. If he defends his pawn with his queen, then I can always attack it again and either force it to move and, and get real compensation with his bishop and on the light squares, or I can just win it back right away. And also notice this pawn is hanging as well if the queen moves. Um, and, and if you somehow like push a pawn to, to, to move it out of capture, then my bishop has a really good diagonal looking at g2, and, and it makes this bishop very hard to move. And black just gets very easy play. So, um, because ideally, as black, I would like to recapture this pawn with my knight, if possible. So, so black played e6. Um, and here, white played knight f3, just to try to complete development. Knight f6, bishop e2, uh, again, realizing that this pawn is, is pretty much a goner for all intents and purposes, so he's just trying to complete his development. So knight takes e4, castle, queen d5, knight e1, defending this guy, knight c6, bishop e3, bishop d6. Okay, so we've kind of gotten out of the opening phase, and if we notice, all of black's pieces are very well posted. These bishops are are quite powerful. This knight has a monster square on, on e4. This queen is very well centralized on d5. It's very hard to chase it away. And all of white's pieces are kind of clustered on the back rows. Uh, white has an isolated pawn on d4, that's a weakness. Black has, you know, real compensation here for the exchange. Don't, don't forget black is down material here. But, you know, black has a pawn for the exchange and also real compensation because his pieces are also good. So, um, I'm just going to go to move 20. This game was actually won by black in 50 moves. This game was won by black in 50 moves. Uh, but I'm just going to move 20 just to kind of give you a flavor of what, what happened. Because this is actually not the game I want to talk to you about. But I'll just go to move 20 just to show you what happened. So, so it would be a bishop f3 castle, g3, f5, bishop g2, b4. These two pawns are threatening to create a pass pawn very quickly. And, and white doesn't really have enough coordination to, to meet it properly. So at f3, knight f6, f4, queen b5, king h1, knight d5. And if you just look at black's position, it's it's kind of overwhelming in a way. Uh, white played bishop g1, and after b3, I mean, you can kind of see how, how black won this game, right? I mean, you know, like c3 and b2 are coming. This knight can maybe hop into b4. This knight is kind of stuck defending these these squares can never really get to this square ultimately because it has to stop this knight from coming to c2. Um, and, and black can even, uh, you know, try to offer a trade of rooks because this rook is, you know, probably worse than any of black's minor pieces. And so, yeah, black ended up winning this game 50 moves. So, um, so okay. So it, it, it kind of leads us to this interesting idea that, you know, oops, let me get rid of these arrows. Um, this, this interesting idea that black has of, of a6, which seems like, you know, ludicrous at first glance, but, um, but as you see, black actually mustered up some real compensation and it turned out that, you know, black was actually just winning almost after 21 moves. Okay, so after the tournament, poor, poor Gensling, you know, finished two out of nine and, and somehow just, you know, was up in exchange after move eight against uh, an international master and, and 12 moves later was was pretty much lost. He was despondent, so he, he called his friend Fellow, fellow Frenchman and Super Grandmaster Romain Edouard, FIDE 2660 or so. Um, they're, they're good friends and they were born a year apart, so they were coming up uh, on the French national team together as juniors. And they're from the same area. So he calls up his friend Romain Edouard and says, Zut alors! Look what happened in my game! And, and, and Romain says, Yes, yes, I, I know. That was terrible. So he, his friend offers some console, uh, consolation and says, you know, okay, you could have played better, but um, but this uh, this idea that, that that black played was actually kind of interesting. 
Um, so, you know, you shouldn't feel too bad because, you know, even though the computer says, you know, you're completely winning at some point, okay, it's, it's actually not so clear for a human. And, um, and, and it's, hard for, it's hard for white to actually find useful moves in this position. So, um, so Alain says to Romain, well, okay, all right, I, I guess you have a point. And then Romain says, listen, I I'm, I'm going to show you something. Uh, w watch my tournament game in about six weeks and I I I'll show you something. And Alain says, okay. So fast forward to yesterday, where we had the final round of the Four Nations Chess League, which is a big British team tournament. And let's check out the game between Norway's number two player in the world, Jean Ludwig Hammer, and Mr. Romain Edouard. So this was a Four Nations Chess League game, and uh, Hammer is Norway's board two, Edouard is France's board four. So this is a potential Olympiad matchup in the near future, depending on how Norway and France stack their boards, but uh, this is also an important matchup for their for their league game. So let's see what opening Alain's friend Romain Edouard chooses. Okay, well we got E D4, D5, C4, D takes C4, E4, B5, this looks familiar. A4, C6, A takes B5. C takes b5, knight c3, this looks familiar, this looks familiar. So let's take a vote. Who thinks that black will play a6 here? Who thinks black will play a6 here? Anybody? Does anybody think black will be crazy enough to play a6 here? Don't forget now, he's not playing Alain, uh, he's not playing uh, Alain Gensling here. He's playing John Ludwig Hammer, a 26-47 GM. Are, are you going to be giving an exchange to a 26-47 GM on move 8? Are you? I mean, let, let's be serious. Uh, okay, I mean, against Alain Gensling, who's having a bad tournament, who's 2 out of 7 at that point, uh, okay, you know, you can play moves like A6, but against a 2647 GM in the Four Nations Chess League final round when you need a win? A6 hook? It should be 7? A6 hook? A6. Knight takes B5, A takes B5, Rook takes A8, but should be 7, Rook A1. Alright, well... We, we got the A6 hook. So I wonder, where did Romain get that idea? Was it from his friend Alain? Potentially. Potentially. This is where Grandmasters get opening preparation from. So, did Ludwig Hammer manage to play better? Well, sure he did. Sure he did. Okay. So, Rook A1, E6, again. Still following the game. Bishop b2, knight f6, knight f3, still following the game. Knight takes e4, castle queen d5. So, uh, very familiar, right? Very familiar. Okay, so knight e1, okay, familiar. I, I guarantee you that uh, John Ludwig did not know of that game. He's kind of just playing based on instinct. But I can tell you who didn't know of that game. I can tell you who didn't know of that game because black played these moves very quickly and white did not play these moves very quickly. So black had a huge time advantage already at this point. So, you know, objectively, may, maybe white is better here. But um, he, black had a big time advantage. You can't really tell from negative 18 to a minute 48 or whatever, but uh, I can assure you that at this point, Black did have a large time advantage. Okay, so knight c6, just developing. Knight c2. Okay, so now this actually looks remarkably similar to the game I just showed you. You know, all of Black's pieces are kind of well posted. 
Okay, the, the question now is where should black post this bishop? Should black post the bishop on e7? Or should black post the bishop on d6? What do you guys think? What do you guys think? So who, who thinks bishop e7 and who thinks bishop d6? Because really those are only two moves that make sense, right? I mean, because we want to get castled and we want to get our bishop out. There's no other real things that we can do in this position yet. So who likes bishop e7 and who likes bishop to d6? Bishop e7, bishop d6, bishop e7, bishop d6. Which is better? Which is better? Okay, so remember in the game I showed you, black played bishop d6. Remember that? And I showed you his two bishops were quite powerful. But it turns out that in this position, bishop d6 is actually a mistake. Bishop d6 is actually a mistake. And why is bishop to d6 a mistake? Well, it's actually a couple of reasons. One is you have to always be careful in chess about pseudo-activity. So it, on d6, this bishop does seem more active because it has a better diagonal, but it's pseudo-active because this bishop actually doesn't really accomplish anything on this diagonal, right? I mean, it's hitting h2, but we can't really put more pressure on h2. But what does it do? Well, it also removes squares from our pieces. Most importantly, it removes squares from our queen. It removes a square from our knight. And to top it all off, this bishop probably wants to be hitting a target. And is this really a target? Whoops, is this really a target? Probably not. What's a better target? Well, this is probably a better target. And so from d6, we can't really hit this target. But from e7, we can. From e7, we can. So for those reasons, bishop e7 is better. But our GM friend was still thinking about that game that I showed you. And so he actually did play bishop d6, which is a mistake. And now, how should white take advantage? How should white take advantage? So white played the accurate bishop to f3. And now this queen's in a little bit of a pickle because we have this pin coming. And this knight is potentially coming to, to e3 at some point. And so white is actually better here. Okay, so, so black should probably be prepared after bishop f3 that black probably has to play f5 in the very near future because white can put more pressure on this, on this knight with, you know, rook e1 and even potential queen e2. And so eventually Black off play f5. I mean, black can move this knight, for example, to e7 and, and defend this a second time, but eventually black off play f5. For example, if knight e7, rook e1, um, hitting knight a second time, now probably f5 would be necessary. And white has an edge. Okay, but white instead, or black instead, played a bishop to b8, realizing that, okay, maybe his queen does need some squares. Um, but again, his bishop is probably on the wrong diagonal. It looks really nice, but it, it probably needs to be on this one. Okay, so, so white played rook e1, black played f5. And now white kind of cashed in and, and took on e4, took on e4, and played queen g4. So now we're, we're attacking this, and we're attacking, whoops, 
So now we're attacking two pawns. Okay. So. So far, so good. Okay, but, well, it's more important to save this g7 pawn. Because when white takes on e4, it opens up our bishop a little bit. So, and also we can't really defend e4. I mean, I guess we could play like knight e7, but again, queen takes g7 is probably really strong. Because our knight doesn't really belong on e7. Because notice, like, after knight e7, queen takes g7, this knight can't really move too well. Because our queen's kind of on this, and, like, we're threatening to do this, and... All sorts of trickiness ensues. So uh, Black just castled, because now it also gets his rook on the f-file. Um, okay, so, so white took, and black exchanged queens, and white took, and black played e5. Okay, so this looks pretty good, right? This looks pretty good. Um, so white could probably play d5 with the idea that after knight e7 uh, he could play like knight to b4. And the point is, okay, you know, black, black could take on d5, but by exchanging pieces it actually makes Black's job tougher. Because the, like, the more pieces that are on the board, the kind of more uncomfortable Black or White feels. But by, by trading pieces, um, White's edge kind of grows. Uh, but White simply took the pawn, figuring, OK, I'm, I'm going to be up a, a whole exchange. And so Black took with the bishop. And now here is the move of truth. Here is the move of truth. Because white is better here. Uh, white is up a full exchange, uh, four pawns against four pawns, and white has an extra rook for a bishop. So the question is, what should white do here? And this is where uh, John Ludwig starts to go wrong. I, again, I believe he was in time trouble already at this point, but what, what should white play here? Does anyone know what, what should white play here? What 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 do you guys think white should do here? It's kind of tricky because it seems like black has a lot of activity, but um, you know we kind of got rid of our our weaknesses. Like this pawn on d4, remember, was kind of a weakness. We got rid of it, and so all we're left with is just these pawns and this pawn, and none of them are particularly weak. But our pieces are are a bit jumbled. They're you know our pieces are all kind of undefended. They're, they're liable to attack, maybe. So what what should uh so what should white do here? Anyone you know? Anybody know? Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a question that has a very non obvious answer. I'm going to ask you a question that has a very non-obvious answer. The question is, what is white's worst piece? What is white's worst piece? And this is a difficult question. Because if you can answer this question correctly, you know, you know, what, you know what white should play. What is white's worst piece? Yeah. So it's funny because everyone is wrong. And I and I uh I don't blame you guys for being wrong cuz like I said this question is tough. But the worst piece on the board is actually this guy. It's actually this guy. 
And you might think, okay, this that's absurd. It's centralized. How can it be the worst piece on the board? Well, how many legal moves does it have that don't hang it? Well, it really only has one, two, three, four, five. But each move it has actually makes the piece worse, sort of. Not to mention that there are always potential ideas of this bishop attacking this rook. Not, not necessarily right away, but there's always potential ideas of, of that being a possibility. So what's the best move then? The best move is rook to e1 with the simple idea of rook to d1 and then trying to get the rook to d7. It's, it's very, very simplistic, but the rook on d1 is much better than the rook on e4. So rook to e1 and rook to d1 is what white should have played. But again, it's a very kind of deep idea. And like even after I told you guys what to look for, you guys couldn't figure it out. So um, it's tricky. It is tricky. So yeah, if I play rook to e1 and you play rook to d8, don't forget I can play bishop g5. And now all of a sudden your rook is in trouble. Because if you keep it on this file, then all of a sudden your back rank becomes a little bit weaker. And now I have time to play rook to b1, or rook to a2, and, and then try to push b3 and kind of dislodge your pawns. Also I can eventually start playing knight a3 and, and start going after these pawns. And I always also have this knight before idea as well at some point. Because now if you take, I can take the, the bishop and get rid of your two bishops. So uh, all this type of stuff is, is happening. Um, so yeah, R rook, to, rook to e1 is definitely the move. So the problem with knight to b4, oops, sorry, the problem with knight to b4 unfortunately, is that black actually has this cute idea uh, of bishop to d4. And the point is that I'm threatening bishop takes f2. And if you do something to defend this, for example, if you play bishop e3, I play knight takes b4, hitting the rook. And then I play knight c2. And then all of a sudden, I'm fine. Because I'm forking your, your rooks. So you have to play, after bishop d4, you have to take on c6. But now I play bishop takes f2, check. check. You play king f1, I play bishop g3, check. check. You play king g1, I play bishop f2, check. check. You play king f1, and it's a draw. So knight to b4 is good enough for a draw, but white should be trying to do better. So... Uh, rook to e1 is the correct move, but John Ludwig was worried about these pawns, so he plays rook to b1. So he's he's freeing his rook from this pin, he's potentially getting ready to play b3, and he's also defending this pawn so that he can move his bishop. So a logical enough move, a logical enough move, but the problem the problem with this move is, well, let's, let's look at the geometry here. Let's look at the geometry here. W what looks precarious all of a sudden? What did this move, rook to b1, suddenly make pop out to you guys? Well, if it's me, I see this, I see this, and I see this. And it makes me want to get my bishop here. So I play bishop c8, and it's actually unclear how you stop bishop f5. You probably have to play a move like g4. 
And if you have to play a move like G4, then I'm probably fine. I'm probably fine, because now you've incurred a, a weakness. Now you've incurred a weakness. Now there's always these ideas, not saying I should play it right away, but there's always these ideas now I can play bishop takes h2 check, rook takes f2 check, rook takes c2. It doesn't work right away because, you know, there's always rook e8 and rook takes c8, but just saying that now these ideas are starting to, to, to pop up. And so it's a lot more difficult for white to hold his position if he's forced to play a move like g4. Um, so bishop c8 would have been a nice, a nice move. Uh, it actually ended up kind of happening anyway. Uh, black played bishop f6 first. And here, uh, white pretty much had to stop bishop c8 by playing a move like rook e6, uh, with the idea that if bishop c8, rook takes c6, bishop f5, and at least try to get, take some material for it. But even here, black is probably doing fine. Um, it, it's probably drawish. Like, bishop will take on c2 and bishop will play a4. And it's going to be hard for uh, white to break through, because he's always going to have to babysit this pawn, so this rook can't really ever get out. And this pawn on b5 will be impregnable. Um, but this is probably what white had to try. Um, but instead, white played rook to e2, and now all of a sudden, unfortunately, all his pieces get really mixed up. So bishop c8, getting ready to play bishop f5. And now he really had to realize what was going on in the position and play a move like <laughs> rook to a1. Uh, just getting out of this pin because this pin is going to become very, 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 very bad. Um, but rook a1 is kind of admitting that rook b1 was a mistake. And so he don't want to admit your mistake, so he's playing b3. He still doesn't really sense the danger. But, but now all of a sudden black is actually better. Well, what does black play here? What does black play here? Yeah, these bishops are becoming monsters. So, so what does black play here? So black played the correct bishop to g4. So the reason this move is important. There's a reason this move is important. And the reason is you, you kind of want to force uh, white into playing f3. Because if white plays f3, now you're playing bishop to f5 with the idea that you want to play bishop to d3, force rook to f2, and then you can maybe play like knight to d4. And then if knight takes, you can play bishop takes and pin the rook to the king. And all of a sudden, all of white's pieces are just super tied down. Um, so after bishop g4, white actually eschewed f3 completely. and instead played this move king to f1. Okay guys, so white played king to f1. What should black do here? What should black do here? So it's actually funny. It seems like, okay, well, we've done the hard work. We should take the rook. But it turns out that taking the rook is actually not what we want to do. Taking the rook is actually not what we want to do.
And why is that? Well, it turns out we, we don't actually want to trade our bishop for this rook. We actually want to trade our bishop for that rook. So the right move here is actually to play bishop f5, which looks paradoxical. But the point is, after pawn takes pawn, knight d4, now we're threatening to win a piece. So black should pro or white should probably take. Now we take on this square, on b1, and now we're threatening to play bishop takes d4, as well as bishop to d3. So, white must play something like knight e6, which moves his knight out of capture, while simultaneously attacking our rook. But now we can play a move like rook to a8, say. And now again, we're threatening to capture this and threatening to play bishop d3. So eventually we're gonna end up with this extra pawn on c4 and two bishops. And this should be a win for black. So that's take on e2. Rook d8 is also reasonable. Uh, although it probably is nothing more than equal after pawn takes pawn, take the rook, take the uh, bishop, take the pawn, and rook b7. Because notice now it's knight and bishop versus knight and bishop. So white can always form a blockade on a light square. And so this is much harder to win, if not impossible, because now white has an active rook as well. This rook is going to come to c7 and win this c4 pawn. So you always have to be careful that you, you don't give up the wrong type of material. Um, so bishop f5 was correct. Uh, uh, white played, or black played c3, which is also pretty good. This move c3 is also pretty good. Um, okay, so white played bishop e3, which is reasonable just to get his pieces out. Again, I mean, moving this rook is pointless. If you play rook e1, I just play bishop f5 again, and you still have the same problems as before, but again, it's even worse because I'm playing this knight d4 move. So he, he can't remove the rook, so bishop e3. And now again, white sees no need to take the rook because he always has his bishop f5 move. So he gets his rook to a better square. And that better square is now no longer d8. And this is another reason why rook d8 was slightly inaccurate. But this rook actually has a better square. And that square is a8. And a8 is better because it can come down to a2. So rook a8. And now white has one final chance for salvation. And that's to play f3 with the idea that after bishop f5, he can play rook to d1. And this is probably uh, actually drawish now. I don't think black has anything better really than to play take, take, knight b4, rook c1, knight a2, rook c2, knight b4, rook c1, knight a2, and I think this is just a draw. You can't play rook to a1, don't forget, because I can play c2. I'm hitting two rooks at the same time. Um, and you can't play rook to b1, obviously, because I can play c2 forking your rooks. But I think, what well, black has nothing better than here, but white missed this last chance. So probably black, what he should have done in this position, after king f1, c3, bishop e3, is he probably should have taken on e2 first, Check. and then played rook a8 with the idea of playing rook to a2 in the near future. Um, so something like king d3, king f7, b4, g5, f3, king g6. And OK, I mean, you know, white always has to worry about this, this pawn on c3. Um, but it's unclear if, if black can actually win this. I mean, black, only black could win, but, you know, White has some some drawing chances here, um, but yeah, after rook a8, White kind of has to bite the bullet, play f3, rook d1, and just kind of hold on. Um, 
say f3 bishop d5 and, and rook d1 just just to get out of this pin and again here in this position if, if black plays rook a2 immediately uh, then I actually have this knight e1 square to go to and if c2 I can play rook c1 and now I'm on this pawn three times So for example, knight a5, threatening knight b3, g4, hitting this. So if you take on b3, I'll take on g f5, you'll take on c1, I'll take on c1. And I'll just be up a piece. So bishop g6, and now b4. And now if knight b3, I can probably just take on, on c2 a bunch and be fine. Um, so knight c4 probably, and then bishop f4, h6 g2, knight a3, trying to hold on to this pawn. Um, but, I mean, I don't think white's in as much danger as he was a few moves ago. Because again, it, this pawn's deep, but it's really hard to get it. It's really hard to control this square c1. It's really hard to control this square c1. Um, I mean, white really probably can't make progress either, but this is most likely a draw. Um, okay, but bishop, bishop c5 was kind of the, the last mistake. Um, okay, because that now after rook a2, now white probably has to do something like rook e8 check, check. and rook f8 check. check just to get out of this with a gain of tempo um, so that he can play after uh, king g6, he can play... Um, you can play a knight move, knight to e3 or something, oops, knight to e, whoops, 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 <laughs> knight to e3 or something, um, but white, <laughs> white chose to play f3 at the wrong time, unfortunately. Or even rook to c1 just to get out of the pin. But yeah, he chose the wrong time to play f3. So he played f3 here. Oops, after a 2 And now it's uh, black to move and win. Black to move and win. This one's kind of obvious. But you know the old saying, pin it to win it. So bishop f5 simply just wins the game instantly. Because we're actually threatening two things. We're threatening this, but we're also threatening to stop one square short and pin this way. So white's actually losing a lot of material by force here. So for example, if rook c1 to defend the knight, bishop d3 wins material. Or else you're just going to lose a knight at least. So uh, white tried rook c1, black played bishop d3, white tried b4, and now the f final piece de resistance. When you're attacking one rook, it's always better to attack two rooks. So we got this rook on lock, well it'd be nice if we got this rook on lock. So bishop to g5. Very picturesque. We got we got this going. We got this going. Crisscross. And we got this going. That's the triangle of doom. So it's a small, small triangle. But it's a triangle of doom. Because white can resign. And white did resign because he is indeed losing all his pieces. So, for example, probably relatively best is something like rook to d1, but then I can just take on e2, and then I can take on c2, Check. and now I'm just up a piece. And also this pawn is very close to promoting. And yeah, so white resign. Alright. So... 
has a little lecture for you guys on how uh, how grandmasters sometimes can get inspiration for their opening.